Greetings to all those who are joining in this podcast service from the Potchefstroom Methodist Church in the Northwest Province of South Africa. This morning's message will focus on one of the last teachings that the Lord Jesus Christ gave when at the Passover supper just prior to his arrest, which the church remembers as the Last Supper, he told his disciples that he was the way, the truth, and the life. In our prayer of adoration today, we will continue to explore our loving Heavenly Father God's character and nature as we use another of his sacred names, Jehovah Rophe, the one who brings healing. My name is Edward Brown, and I am one of the ministers here in Potchefstroom. Let us pray. Praise to your holy name, eternal God, who created all things by your spoken word, and then declared everything to be good, by which you meant perfect. It was your divine intention that everything remain good and healthy for all time. But Adam and Eve's rebellion destroyed the harmony of your creation, until all was corrupted, and even the earth gradually produced its crops. Its waters were spoiled. And so you waited for the perfect opportunity to reveal yourself by a new name to your people. It was at the undrinkable waters of Marah, at the refugee nation of Israel, trudging thirstily through the desert, first learnt of your nature as Jehovah Rophe, the one who delights to heal and restore to wholeness that which is not so. For it was at those bitter springs that at your command your servant Moses cast a piece of wood into the pool to heal and transform the corrupted waters to give life-giving blessings to needy people and their flocks. Lord Jehovah Rophe, your healing power over the land was displayed through your servant Elijah, for he prayed for rain after a long drought, and you sent that healing and life-giving water to that thirsting land. Lord Jehovah Rophe, we your people pray today for healing rains for those parched and drought-stricken parts of our country that produce our crops and provide grazing for our livestock. Lord Jehovah Rapha, your healing power over illness and even death was displayed through your servant Elisha in the healing of Naaman, a Syrian general, from leprosy, and by his raising of the Shunammite woman's son in those healings. We see the forerunners of the healings that were to come with the advent of your Messiah Christ. We praise you, Lord Jesus Christ, the living manifestation of Jehovah Rapha. For you lived out that role amidst the people of Palestine. You cured every kind of illness, drove out every unclean spirit, and brought back to life the dead. It mattered not to you whether the person was Jew or Gentile, old or young, male or female, all who came to you received the healing that your Father longed to pour out into the lives of the broken. Praise your name, Jehovah Rapha, Jesus, for you healed the rifts that sin had caused between people and the Eternal Father God, for you declared their sins forgiven, thereby drawing them back into a relationship with the Father. Praise your name, Jesus, Jehovah Rapha, for then you went even further in the mightiest deed of healing of all, and one that even left the angels astounded. You went and died on the cross in order that the power of sin to cause disease and spiritual death might be ended forever. Praise your name, Holy Spirit, Jehovah Rapha among us, for you equip the people of God to be conduits for healing to the church and to the broken peoples of the world. Lord God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, touch our lives today that we may in your name reveal you as Jehovah Rapha to the world that needs you. We pray these things as we join in the prayer that our Lord Jesus Christ gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Our devotional hymn for today is by the American Anglican Bishop of New Jersey, Reverend George Washington Doan. It is Thou Art the Way, and it is hymn 160 in the Methodist hymn book. Thou art the way. To thee alone from sin and death we flee, and he who would the Father seek must seek him, Lord, by thee. Thou art the truth. Thy word alone true wisdom can impart. Thou only canst inform the mind and purify the heart. Thou art the life. The rending tomb proclaims thy conquering arm, and those that put their trust in thee, not death nor hell, can harm. Thou art the way, the truth, the life. Grant us that way to know, that truth to keep, that life to win, whose joys eternal flow. Amen. Having just heard Mr. Doan's hymn of praise to the Lord Jesus, let us read together the passage that inspired him and is our scripture lesson. It is from St. John's Gospel, chapter 14, reading from verse 1. And Jesus said, Do not be worried and upset. Believe in God and believe also in me. There are many rooms in my Father's house, and I am going to prepare a place for you. I would not tell you this if it were not so. And after I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to myself, so that you will be where I am. You know the way that leads to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, so how can we know the way to get there? And Jesus answered him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except by me. Now that you have known me, he said to them, you will know my Father also. And from now on you do know him, and you have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, that is all we need. Jesus answered, For a long time I have been with you all, yet you do not know me, Philip. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Why then do you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe, Philip, that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words I have spoken to you, Jesus said to his disciples, Do not come from me. The Father who remains in me does his own work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. If not, believe because of the things I do. I am telling you the truth. Whoever believes in me will do what I do. Yes, he will do even greater things, because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask for in my name, so that the Father's glory will be shown through the Son. If you ask me for anything in my name, I will do it. May God bless this passage from Scripture. Amen. The New Testament reveals the Lord Jesus Christ to have been a master teacher. Sometimes he used examples from everyday life to convey his messages, while at others he used amusing or just plain ludicrous images. Who can forget his saying, it was easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get into heaven. But when it came to teaching about his mission and ministry, the Lord preferred to use metaphors. In fact, he was the supreme master of this literary device, as he would take an idea and make it applicable to himself in a way that had his listeners understanding difficult concepts very easily. To the people who were stumbling around in the confusion of the Jewish religious darkness, he said, I am the light of the world. 
To the spiritually hungry, he said, I am the bread of life. To those who knew they were separated from the Heavenly Father God and longed to get to him, he said, I am the gate. In the passage that you read from John's Gospel, Jesus responded to the concern of Thomas, and those of us who, like Thomas, are uncertain of where Jesus was headed and in what direction we are expected to go by declaring, I am the way. But before we unpack this teaching, let us look at the background to the statement by the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, this is the best course of action to approach all passages of Scripture. Never just take a paragraph or verse out of its context. Always look at what the writer was saying to the original target audience before extrapolating as to what that message could mean for today. In that way, you are more likely to hear what God wants to communicate to you instead of ending up with the current politically correct or socially desired interpretation of that verse. But now back to our text. The setting was the Passover supper the Lord Jesus presided over for the disciples in the upper room in Jerusalem. For the disciples, the Passover supper represented the end to a busy and hectic week in which they had accompanied their master Jesus in the temple while he ministered. The time in the temple had not been easy, as they had witnessed how the Lord and the Jewish authorities had been in almost constant conflict, and they were no doubt feeling the strain and anticipating a peaceful Passover weekend. The first indication that the future was about to unfold in a way that they had not anticipated was Christ Jesus' news that he was going to leave them. Unlike them, at that moment in time anyway, we also know that this was to be the last meal that he would have with them, for within a few hours he would be betrayed, abandoned, denied, arraigned, tortured and executed. But all that lay unknown in the future. All that the disciples knew was that their beloved leader, on whose presence so much depended and in whose fellowship they so delighted, was going away. It was into the situation that Thomas, the speaker in this encounter, courageously spoke the words that you and I, who like the rest of the disciples, are too afraid to speak out aloud, lest people think us uninformed or spiritually backward. Lord, we do not know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Most of us in the quiet of our hearts long for some kind of direction and guidance. For we find ourselves confused by the many political and religious ideologies that abound in the world. And we bewail a true lack of direction that the church should be giving in the wake of such problems as abortion on demand to children as young as 12 years old, alcohol sales to minors, which I have witnessed with my own eyes, the decriminalization of the use of cannabis, which is a known gateway drug, not to mention the muddy waters of alternative lifestyle rights, which seem to expand almost daily to include some new deviant behavior or other. When all is in flux around us, the voice of Christ Jesus promises guidance, for he speaks clearly and unmistakably, giving to all who truly are looking for a way in life a clear direction. In so doing, he starts with a bold and very dangerous and life-challenging claim. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Before we go further, it is imperative we decide on the validity of the first part of the statement. By identifying himself as I am, Jesus was claiming equal status with the Father and Creator God. I am was the accepted translation of the most sacred title of God, Yahweh, or Jehovah, the God who was present. The disciples and the early church, which included two of Jesus' brothers, James and Jude, it is their letters that we have in the New Testament, were all God-fearing Jews, and as such would have examined Jesus' life in minute detail before believing that Jesus qualified to apply the title to himself. And only then would they have given their full allegiance to him and worshipped him as God. That is the decision that everyone must make for themselves. For it is only those who accept Jesus as the Son of God and are open to examining the evidence for himself that he might be, that his claim to being the way can have any meaning. 
I believe that in saying that Jesus was giving mankind an exact destination, Jesus said, I am the way. Firstly, he is the way to victory over sin. The way of Jesus leads up to and through the cross. There is no other way around it. The only way to defeat sin is to journey to the cross, to confess your sin there, and ask the Heavenly Father to forgive your sin, because Jesus has taken the punishment for sin on your behalf when he died on Calvary. Do you want your past, all your mistakes, every bad or evil action and word forever struck from God's record? Come to Jesus, the way to victory over sin. Jesus then said, I am the way, indicating that he was a vic had victory over sin and death. The Gospels reveal how Jesus had repeatedly told his disciples that he was to die. On this particular night, however, they did not know that his death, and it was a violent and horrible one at that, was only a matter of hours away. But as John 10, verse 17 and 18 record, he had also told them that his life was his own in every way. It could not be taken from him without his permission. In other words, Jesus could not be killed without cooperating fully with his enemies. He would lay down his life at the moment of his choosing, and then would take it up again in accordance with the command that God had given him. Do you want to know that death will not be the end for you? By his resurrection, Jesus has opened the way for anyone who is in a relationship with him to share in his victory of eternal life over death. Jesus then said, I am the way of truth. In his teachings, and indeed in his life, truth not only prevailed exclusively, but it characterized his nature. You see, Jesus was the embodiment of truth. He is a standard by which truth is measured. Indeed, if only one single aspect of his life can be proved to be false, then he could not have been God. Furthermore, the Christian believer would have no hope. For our entire belief system is built on the person of Jesus of Nazareth. But as I said earlier, Jesus' two brothers, James and Jude, became leaders in the early church because they believed him to be perfect. If they could have remembered a single unkind word, attitude or action on his part while growing up in the same home, they would have denounced him for being for a fraud, and in all likelihood would have become enemies of his church. But they did not know. They believed him to be the living truth of God. In a world where truth and honesty are very rare commodities, Jesus invites everyone to his timeless truths about God, life, everlasting. Jesus said, I am the way of life. Jesus is the way of life because he is the source of life. In the opening verses of St. John's Gospel, the old apostle who had by then had decades to ponder over the nature of his beloved master, wrote on creation in relationship to Jesus, whom in Greek he called the Logos, which when very roughly translated and simplified to a Sunday school level, meant the divine and omnipotently active living word of God. And to assure that his readers would not be confused, he even began his gospel with the same words with which the book of Genesis began. In the beginning, he wrote, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. But Christ Jesus is more than just the creator and source of life. He has not abandoned us like a wind-up clock and left us to run down on our own devices. He became in the incarnation the pattern for all human life. He reveals to us the way to live if we let him do so. And he promises that in him we shall participate in all the rich fullness of life that is our heritage as the children of God. And so when trouble strikes... Jesus is the way. In personal, social, national and international tensions, Jesus is the way if individuals 
and those most arrogant and pig-headed of all people, politicians, will only allow him to go before him. In our daily temptations, Jesus, who faced every temptation without giving in to sin, will be with us to help us to be victorious. Over the last 2,000 years of the Church, generations of our Christian forefathers have experienced that by living in a relationship with Jesus, that he led them to God's glory through every facet of their lives, whether that be work or leisure. At this point, however, it is necessary to deal with the heresy that has crept into many a liberal Christian's theology, namely that while they accept that Christ Jesus has saved them, they leave the possibility open that salvation may be achieved by some other way for another person following a belief system that does not have Jesus at its centre. The next words of Jesus dispel this position, for he makes a declaration of exclusivity. He said, No man comes to the Father but by me. The acid test of Christian theology is what a person does with the person of Jesus. The only valid Christian theological position relating to salvation is that Jesus has made the claim that in him alone may salvation be achieved. It astounds me that in a world that deals in the absolutes of mathematics, physics and chemistry, that there are Christians who are afraid of the divine doctrine that Jesus Christ is the absolute in spiritual salvation. Any proclamation that Jesus Christ is only one option in which salvation may be achieved has reduced his divinity to mere humanity, and a purely human Jesus cannot save us or reduce our state of human despair. Countless people who have been rescued from the occult or some other religion have attested to the exclusivity of Jesus. As St. Peter declared to the Jewish leaders in the Sanhedrin, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. That's from Acts 4 verse 12. Christ Jesus invites all people everywhere to come from life's deepest desperations to him as the way. He invites all people everywhere to receive him as the clear and simple designation of heaven for earth's afflictions. He invites us as his church to be consistent in giving to him absolute authority and mastery over our lives. Have you lost your way? Christ Jesus declares, I am the way. When Bishop Samuel Wilberforce, the son of the anti-slavery politician William Wilberforce, was once asked by someone on the way to heaven, he replied, Take the first turn to the right and go straight ahead. Let us get on to the King's Highway, Jesus, and travel straight to eternity with him. Amen. Let us close with the Trinitarian benediction. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. <laughs>